Hi, my name is Keith Gray. I'm the Director of High Performance Computing at BP. Wanted to thank Intel for sponsoring this session on workforce development and career planning. Um, one of the challenges that we faced in developing a capability in high performance computing at BP was identifying the necessary skill sets and the people that will enable the research that we're responsible for. And so we've looked for experienced people, really struggled to find the breadth of skills that were needed. Over the last 15 years, the way we have solved this problem has been by building a pipeline of students that have served internships and come into our group been able to demonstrate their technical skills, their drive, and their willingness and ability to work in our culture. And all of those were critical to the success of our team. So we've been able to identify the potential interns because we focused our recruiting efforts on a couple of key schools. Rice and the University of Texas have been critical for us. The people are incredibly talented. They understand the opportunities in oil and gas, and they're willing and excited about living in Houston. And that's been valuable at times. So um, as we look forward, we want to find people in a breadth of skills. So computational and applied math, computer science, statistics, visualization, and domain sciences. We bring them in, we expect a relatively long learning period where we need to make the necessary investments in these people to give them broader opportunities on the job training, um, additional skills, and sometimes even helping fund their additional education through on the job masters uh, we have one person in the team at the moment who is working an online master's in computer science at Rice right now. And so that's been really important for us because we've been able to really double the computational skills in our team in the last six, seven years. We've changed the contributions we make to BP's research efforts. We've changed how people use the high performance computing systems that we deploy and we're able to continue to scale. So let me stop there. We'll continue this conversation as we walk our way through this. Uh, let me introduce Jan Odegaard. He is the executive director of the ION project at Rice. Right in the heart of the four mile long innovation corridor stretching from downtown Houston to the world's largest medical district, the Texas Medical Center, is the site of a transformational project that will serve as a nucleus for Houston's fast growing, diverse and inclusive innovation ecosystem. In early 2019, Rice University announced the development of a 16 acre innovation district that will encompass more than 5 million square feet of creative office, multifamily residential, retail, restaurant, hotel, and public park space open to all Houstonians. The district is anchored by the renovation of a historic Sears building into a 300,000 square foot collaboration hub known as the ION. Over 100 million will be invested by Rice University into the ION to catalyze a district that will set a new standard of urbanism, connectivity, and inclusivity in Houston. Good afternoon, everybody, and really good to be back with you. Uh, I wanted to open with that exciting video because it does it more justice than I can do in terms of talking about the vision we have. Uh, it is sad to not be in person with all of you. I, I know this has been a fantastic day and, and I miss all of you. So this, uh, I think about all of you as my family. So, uh, so this is, will be uh, different. So next year we'll be together. But putting all that aside, the ION's mission is really to accelerate innovation and connect communities. 
And the team I'm leading is really about engaging and, and creating the programming in this building that is the ION, that is that renovated building, that really amplify this being a very diff different uh, sort of real estate product, if you will. It's not a place where, it is a place where you also come to your office, but it's a place also where you engage with the building and will the, all the programming that we are putting on. Uh, you know, so what is the programming, you know? Well, the building is very purposefully built around architectural features that is designed to create collisions, uh, you know, connections and collaborations. And at the core of the building is a six story atrium that actually sort of terminated the bottom in, in a set of forum stairs, as we call them, that can seat 250 people in a theater type styling where, uh, style where we will host TED Talks, workshops, conferences, panels, fireside chats. You name it, the kind of programming that that will amplify what Keith talked about as, as Houston sort of being a place of vibrancy and innovation and technology, a place where you see yourself uh, being, whether it's a founder, entrepreneur, startup, investor, corporate innovators, an academic student, you know, or a community partner that can see, well, this is where things happen in Houston and, and Houston is truly a destination for those kinds of activities. So as you move down from the Forum stairs, you enter what we talk about as the uh, academic and accelerator flexible space that really is surrounded by classrooms where we'll uh, host a number of events and activities, you know, you know, focusing on our accelerator, focusing on workforce development. You know, there's a lot of sort of light touch, uh, you know, bridging maybe to the larger programs that the, our university partners are organizing. But really that lower level of the building is, is to some degree almost like a boiler where it sort of, you know, create the steam and the, the accelerate the particles that creates those collisions and connections that I talked about. And, and we're really focused on four key stakeholders and supporting that being, you know, that when you're a startup entrepreneur, you know, you're an academic network partner, you're a corporate innovator, uh, you know, or a community partner in, in that regards. And, and we are bringing the programming such that, that all of that comes together and delivers value, create a place where people see themselves. You know, one tenant that signed on a tenant lease with us, and also it's a programming partner, you know, they said, I'm not coming to this building because I need to be in this space. I'm coming to this to collide with students, engage with the pipeline, you know, be part of the future of Houston. And, and when they got pressed for how much space you're taking, the answer is, I really see myself occupying the entire building, the 300,000 square feet of the building, because that's how I see this community that really is building and uh, amplifying Houston as a place. You know, the programming that we do is, is spans really wide. You know, as I said, from talent development, whether it be data science, AI, computational science uh, programming, you know, uh, thought leadership, you know, and for your startups, you know, it's, it's the traditional business plan, pitch decks, networks of mentors and subject matter experts. So if you're a corporate in the building, not only do you have access to talent, but you can also contribute back into the programming by just delivering that value, you know, and, and th this is where you will run into your st future students and employees, you know, because the academics, all 10 institutions that have uh, a home base in Houston will have some programming act activity in, in, in the space, you know. So this is really what the exciting progress I'm working on. You know, last year, I think many of you heard uh, a, a, a preliminary view of what the building will be. You know, we'll run four accelerators from day one, you know, and if you're in the startup uh, ecosystem, you know, whether you're doing smart and resilient cities, where you're focusing on aerospace innovation, you know, diversity and inclusion through our partner Div Inc., you know, and the Rice Alliance Clean Energy Accelerator. And next door to us, Greentown Labs, you know, Houston's headquarter for the Boston-based clean tech uh, accelerator. We expect at any point in time to have 30 to 40 startups there for the corporate and the universities to collide and engage with. And that's really sort of amplifying Houston as that nucleus of tech and innovation. And so uh, with that, I just wanted to sort of share that as, as another sort of vehicle or platform to engage the students that were be being educated in Houston and will be part of our pipeline to see, so they can start seeing themselves continuing to live in Houston and engage with that in the tech and innovation ecosystem. So. I'll pass it back to, to Keith, our moderator, and uh, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Um, my name is Melissa Fratkin. I am the Industry Programs Director for the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, and I wanted to talk a bit about what we're doing uh, in workforce development, certainly supported by and in support of our industry partners, uh, about half of whom are uh, from the oil and gas 
industry. We have about 30 partners at this point. This, the program's been around for more than a decade. Um, and one of the things that has been most uh, important to a lot of the, the partners has been workforce development. They want to find students who can be interns and, and graduates who can who can then be hired at the at the at certainly at the energy companies who know how to use advanced computing, who know how to program in parallel. Um, that saves a lot on training time when they get there. Uh, and it certainly makes it easier uh, for them to, to get their foot in uh, and continue working. We at TAC um, are working on always finding um, diverse students to come in uh, and work with us. We fund things like summer programs for um, underrepresented uh, kids from underrepresented minority groups uh, from high school who come in before 2020, uh, come in uh, for, for a week of summer camp. They learn how to program on a Raspberry Pi. They actually get to take the Raspberry Pi home with them. Uh, but for some of these students, it's the first time they've ever been on a college campus and ever been in a dorm and ever been in a classroom and uh, in, a, in a university classroom. And they're very excited to see that, that it's not out of their reach. Uh, and, and a lot of them, in fact, a good percentage of the students who come to our code attack program have gone on and gotten degrees in computer science. So we know we're making a difference. We know it's a small group. It's a cohort of 30 every summer. So it does it, it takes more hands-on, one-on-one activity to get one computer science graduate out of it, but we're making a difference uh, and we are setting up this program to be taught um, in other places. Our industry partners have funded things like uh, student interns to come and work at TAC and to then go and be hired uh, at the companies. They've funded our scientific computing curriculum. Chevron was nice enough to uh, support the development of the curriculum as uh, a uh, distributable um, content so that other people could go out and add modules to what they were teaching uh, and add scientific computing to their to their um, processes. So at the University of Texas, you can actually graduate with an undergraduate certificate uh, in scientific computing, which is akin to a minor, uh, and you can have it added to your graduate portfolio if you take classes from the specific division and tax staff go and teach those classes. And the students in those classes get to run on our supercomputers. So they really are learning, they are really learning um, uh, hands-on how to use these big systems, how to do optimization, how to do software development. Uh, and it's, it's very exciting for them and it gives them, again, a, a leg up and when they get out. Um, we've also had uh, uh, star partner funding for our student cluster challenge teams uh, who who won SC 13, 14, and 15 uh, cluster challenges. We've had multiple partners fund those. Uh, and of course, we love bringing students in and letting them loose and to, to build their own systems and, and learn how to run all those codes. Um, TAC also supports uh, the federally funded research experiences for undergraduates. So we bring in students from, again, all over the country. Um, and this year, in 2020, TAC was one of the few institutions that was able to do virtual REU, and so we had our students uh, in a virtual cohort, uh, and they get to work on their own research projects, but then they also work with TAC researchers, and they work as a cohort, so they, they get to know each other, and they get to further their own research uh, and continue on their way in their path, um, and so we help them uh, with that. And then uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was the SIG HPC fellowship. So the special interest group for high performance computing that's part of ACM uh, offers fellowships every year to uh, sometimes up to a dozen students uh, and there it's a, a grant so it's a, um, <clears throat> a stipend for their for school uh, we get applications from all over the world and the students are in everything from biochemistry to geophysics to you name it um, and they have research projects that they're working on they get a nomination letter from their from their uh, advisor. Uh, and and these, these students are absolutely amazing. It always makes me feel like I've done nothing in my life because these students are incredible. Um, but they get a they get a stipend, they get they get a scholarship to help them continue their studies. Uh, and everything they're doing is using um, high performance computing in their research. And so we get a lot of interesting results of, of, of requests, sorry, for uh, for what the researchers what the students want to do in their research. Um, we know that that oil and gas, and clearly in this conference, is changing to energy, uh, and we work closely with both the Institute for Geophysics uh, and all of the other departments on campus at UT. So we have students from everywhere uh, using our systems, and we teach our we teach our students 
uh, classes in, as I said, in the university so that they can use, and, and the students who take the basics of Fortran and C course are in everything from you know psychology to physics to chemistry, uh, uh, disciplines that we know need high performance computing and disciplines where we're interested that they want to use it more. Happy to help them. Uh, and we are happy to help you find them so that you can hire them. Uh, and I think with that, I am done. And I get to introduce, who am I introducing? Max, right? No, Ling. <laughs> they changed the order on me. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Ling Zhuo. I'm uh, currently uh, working at Chevron as a manager uh, in HPC software engineering. I myself have been an HPC software engineer for for about 20 years and at Chevron. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, not at Chevron, at USC and then at Chevron. And then and I have attended this conference for for in the past uh, almost every year in the past 10 years. So I, I really uh, like to come back here and discuss with you guys uh, on the issues that we all care about. And today, uh, I think I'm assigned the topic to talk about the workforce development at Chevron. And yeah, that's actually my, one of my favorite topics because um, in the past uh, couple of years, Chevron has done so much to, uh, to prepare our workforce for the uh, digital transformation. And especially in the IT function, um, we, the management has realized the need to upskill and reskill our employees with the latest and state-of-the-art technologies, and so we have uh, we have provided the workforce um, the support they need, the resources they need, so that they can learn machine learning, uh, AI, cloud computing as they see fit in their uh, in their roles, in their current roles, and in their future roles. So, and we have. Um, Multi, actually, multiple resources available to employees now. There are Pluralsight, Udemy, O'Reilly, and for for people to to get on, get the training and the resources. And yeah, like I said, um, people who are interested in HPC are encouraged encouraged to attend uh, this conference and also like tech training, as Melissa just mentioned. And and we also have data science learning program data engineering cohort uh, and all kinds of guilds to build up uh, new skills for our workforce. And another thing is we have a, a new thing is the digital scholar program. So it started two years ago, first with MIT and now with Rice too. So it's the goal is to build new digital future leaders in the energy industry. And so people who are selected, uh, all employees are encouraged to apply and people who are selected will be sent to these two universities to get their master degree in data science and computer science. And besides that, Chevron has a long Relationship, long time relationship with USC. We are offer, uh, USC is offering a digital oil fields technologies uh, master degree. And we have a long, yeah, a good relationship with tech. So we always, yeah, whenever we see there are openings, there are new tech training classes in HPC. Yeah, we, our employees are eager to participate. And I think these are all the resources available to to the workforce at Chevron, and I would say uh, Chevron is doing all we can to help people be prepared uh, as much as possible for the digital transformation. And yeah, there is a a huge campaign. There have been a huge campaign at Chevron to advocate the uh, growth mindset to make sure that everyone is knows that it has as lifelong learning as one of their goals. So yeah, uh, because the technologies are coming coming very fast and being updated almost daily. So uh, I think that having the, the right mindset is the most important thing. And that's it for me.
uh, Yan, you are the you are next. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yan Sun, and today I'm assigned to share with you my own career path and how I develop my career. So, my current role at Total is research geophysicist. But before this position, I was working in many different um, research areas. I got my PhD degree in physics department, studying um, soft matter uh, physics, X-ray diffraction, and optical um, systems. And after that, I have several years postdoc uh, experiences in Harvard Medical School and Rice University. Then I decided to move to uh, industrial and stay in Houston with my family. So that's why in um, 2015, I went back to Rice University to get another um, thesis, thesis master degree at Earth Science um, Department, focusing on um, geophysics. But I think unfortunately, um, during that period of the time, um, the oil price dropped, so it became uh, harder to find an internship at that time. Um, but luckily enough, um, with my office mates uh, referral, I got an internship from Total in 2017. And after that internship, um, Total offered me another internship. And um, it eventually um, led to a research geophysicist position after my graduation. So from my um, personal experiences, I think several things helped me to transist my career from academic to industrial. I think first thing is to um, well, well prepare yourself because things, um, you cannot change the environment. So the things you can do is to prepare your, yourself so that when the opportunity comes, you can grab it. So when I was at Rice, um, besides taking required courses from the Earth Science Department, I also um, took several machine learning related courses and did several um, hands-on projects. I think those um, experiences um, broaden my um, skill set and help my um, career development. Oh, and I think um, Rice Career Development Center is also another very good resource where they can help you to work on your resume and also prepare you for the interviews. Um, and they also hold events for students to get connections with industrial companies. Um, I think that will lead to my second point, which I think is important, um, is to build professional connections. So I think at that time, besides, besides attending the events um, held by RICE, I also went um, to the oil and gas conferences uh, with the funding I received from uh, Ken Kennedy Fellowship. So in the conference, um, I got a chance to follow the latest development in the industrial. Uh, and also uh, have a chance to network with people from different companies. I think these experiences um, help me to not only build the professional connections, but also um, understand what the skill set our company is looking for. And then, um, um, so currently at Total, I'm working on several um, different research projects. Um, including like multi-physics joint inversion, uh, global optimization with uncertainty uh, estimation, and also um, to develop deep learning tools uh, for uh, model building and image processing. I think um, among many things I enjoy with my current job, I think one of them is that um, it allowed me to develop new tools and learn new techniques. So for example, every year, Total provide internal training programs and also offer fund, uh, fundings for us to attend workshops, conferences, or even on, online trainings so that we can develop our skill set to um, better prepare for future challenges. Um, so I think in the past two years, I took those opportunities um, to further develop my machine learning skills. I think um, those experiences helped me to broaden my current research project and also allow me to solve industrial problems with different approaches. Um, I think that's um, all um, I want to share today. So I will turn the floor over to our next uh, speaker, uh, Jay. Thank you, Yen. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jay. Uh, so I graduated from Rice uh, in 2016. Uh, so at the rise, I was starting uh, geophysics for my PhD. 
Uh, my topic at the time was uh, mainly on seismic imaging, so which requires extensive use of the HPC. Um, I got the fellowship back to 2013 and uh, 2014. So about my career, uh, so before uh, my full-time position at the Shell, uh, I had uh, a few internships uh, during my PhD study. So the first internship I had was with Total, uh, which is uh, also a research uh, a geophysicist working on migration algorithms. So after that, I have done two internships with Shell. So one is on uh, seismic imaging, one is on depth uncertainty as mission. So uh, the second internship at Shell, uh, I got uh, the full time offer, uh, which was back in 2015. And then I joined um, Shell after I graduated and to become a geophysicist in the uh, software development team. So basically, for my first assignment, uh, our main goal is to develop and also deploy uh, different uh, imaging and also interpretation workflow. So for that position, I have different uh, responsibilities. Uh, so I think some uh, something I enjoy particularly is that I got the chance to really see the latest and the most advanced uh, new technologies and uh, uh, got the chance to try them and think about how to apply all this uh, to the conventional workflow used uh, in our day job. So um, for example, one thing I work on was also as a focal point for the digitalization. So we were looking at uh, different uh, uh, things related to like Python, machine learning, things like that. So we are thinking about how to, for example, develop a deep learning algorithm to help seismic interpretation. Um, and also, I think sometimes some more challenging and also more uh, important thing is that once you have that ready, how do you deploy across um, like, in, like internally? Yeah, because uh, one thing we struggle a lot is that uh, we see um, we have lots of legacy system, legacy software, how to combine the latest uh, technology with what we have. That's uh, sometimes uh, quite challenging. Um, so that's, uh, that's some of the examples what I did for my um, first assignment. So from that, you can see, actually, back to my PhD, I was mainly working on seismic imaging. But for my first assignment, I'm not really using uh, too much uh, the expertise I have developed during the, uh, the PhD on that topic. But one thing I feel quite uh, useful is that I see something I learned uh, back my uh, time at the RICE. I didn't expect that I will be able to use them. I, I, I got the chance to use them. For example, some some information I have learned with uh, Python with uh, HPC, um, I got to that got to help me how to understand how to transform what we have in the legacy software system to the more modern like the cloud environment. So that's something I feel quite useful. And after my first assignment, I uh, become a processing geophysicist uh, near the end of last year. So one thing I feel um, for my career, especially in the early stage, um, is to see as much uh, possibilities as possible. So I think that because uh, I don't want to stay on one area or one topic uh, too early. Uh, so I think uh, one good thing is that if I get a chance to see different parts, how like geophysics are used in the oil industry, that will help me understand better how the 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 whole uh, whole industry works, how the geophysics can better help um, in different uh, uh, aspects, and uh, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much um, what I have been doing for my career. Um, yeah, I think I look forward to talk with you more details later in the uh, in the open conditions in the end. I think next I will introduce uh, Max. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Grossman. Uh, I took a pretty direct route to HPC in, in my career development. Um, I have the dubious honor of, of three different degrees from Rice University, uh, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD. I, I started in HPC as a, an undergraduate working as a, a research assistant in, in Vivek Sarkar's lab at Rice. 
Um, and that's really how I first got involved in the oil and gas industry. I, I did a, a little part-time work with a, a Repsol um, working on kind of HPC and, and GPUs on, on seismic migration workloads. Um, and I've pretty much been involved with HPC in, in some form or another in the oil and gas industry um, for the last uh, probably 10 years. Um, I was a, a fellowship winner in 2012 to 2013. So I think I'm the, uh, uh, the oldest on the panel. Um, so after, after undergrad, I, I, I took a couple of years off from school and, and, and went to work at a software company in San Francisco. Uh, but I, I quickly came back to Rice to, to wrap up a PhD. Um, and part of that PhD was, was uh, generously funded by Shell to work on, on again, HPC style problems. Um, after finishing that PhD, I spent the next few years, the last few years of my life, basically working as a, a data scientist and, and machine learning expert um, with Keith Gray, who's actually moderating this panel uh, at BP, and, and had a really great time doing that. So to some extent, my inclusion on this panel is a, a demonstration of, I guess, successful workforce development. I was the target of that workforce development, and I spent 10 great years working in HPC in, in oil and gas. Um, but my current role, uh, and for the past four weeks, I've been in, uh, an employee of a company called Cruise, which does uh, self-driving cars um, based out in, in California. And so I guess to some extent, I'm also a, a, maybe a representation of the current challenges that oil and gas is, is facing in hiring and workforce development and recruiting of, of particularly digital data science, machine learning, HPC skills. Um, and so I think it's, it's definitely important to acknowledge that. I think that you know, right now, is, uh, my experiences at BP have shown me that right now is a, a really tough time. Um, you know, there are internal problems within energy companies with you know, restructuring and hiring freezes and, and all the, the tough spot that the, the industry is going through right now. Um, but I think it's also important to point out the silver lining of that. You know, the fact of the matter is that young students, young engineers, um, they're just not as interested in working at an oil and gas company um, as they might have been 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and so what this energy transition is going to bring about is, I think, a real shift in attitude towards energy companies. You know, if you can pitch yourself as a solar company or a wind company or, you know, anything other than, a, a, you know, quite frankly, the way society perceives it, a dirty oil and gas company, um, that, I think, you know, makes it a lot more attractive. And so this energy transition, you know, it's, it's, it's rough, um, but I also think it's going to make workforce development and hiring a lot smoother um, when looking at, at that younger that younger generation. Um, if, if I had one advice to give companies on workforce development, you know, one of my first questions to, to my new employer um, working at a, a software company was, what's the attitude on on publications and publishing and, and open source software development, um, and and really, you know, allowing your employees to talk openly and publicly about what they work on because that's you know, you know. Employees are temporary. Eventually, they will move on, and they want to know that what they've built moves on with them, and that they're able to talk about that openly. I think the energy industry had this problem where nobody talks about what they're doing. The defense industry has this problem. A lot of these industries have very closed policies on IP and, and sharing. Um, I think that you know is very synergistic with a hiring problem. If people don't know what you're doing, they don't know the cool stuff you're doing. Um, why should they want to come work with you? You know, I think. Uh, I think that really opening up about the cool technical problems that people are working on at BP and Shell and Exxon and Total and all these places, um, I think that uh, that alone, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks do that really well. And that alone can make, um, make these energy companies a lot more competitive in this, you know, kind of intense hiring environment. So with that, I think I will hand it over to our next panelist. Uh, Emma is a current PhD candidate at Rice University. Uh, so hopefully she can tell us all about how we can hire her. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Zoner. I'm a PhD candidate in the statistics department at Rice University. Um, my research is mainly about functional data basis representation and statistical computing. I'm a recipient of the Ken Kennedy um, Graduate Fellowship. And so last year I presented a poster at the conference and that really allowed me to speak to a lot of people in, in the energy industry and get to know it better and, 
and uh, get an understanding of uh, what a career would be like. And so I'm still a few months away from completing my PhD. And so what I will address is uh, what uh, I would look for um, in, a, in a career in, in the energy industry. And I'll summarize that into three points. Um, the first one would be personal career growth. I'd want a role that allows me to expand my skill set and expertise. And I'd, for that, I'd look at people who came in uh, before me in the role and where they started and where they are in their own career. And ideally, the company would have a, you know, clear options in terms of career plan and also a transparent uh, growth plan and development uh, for their employees. And it would be great to have uh, something like a formal mentorship program or at least an informal way of guiding newcomers in, in their career. And um, a second point is that I would want a company that that values data-driven decisions and is committed to um, to technological growth and algorithmic development. And um, so this is a rather established industry, I feel like, and technology moves fast. So there's there's gonna be um, growing pains and I would try to gauge it, you know, whether the company is saying they're growing in uh, these areas of technology or if they are really dedicating resources for research and development and, and innovation and if um, they're leaving room to try new things. So a third thing I would be looking at is job security. And um, there's a lot of changes that are going on in the, the energy industry at this time. And, um, you know, a low, a low carbon future is pretty certain, but there's not um, exactly a consensus on the timeline and how we will get there. And so this means that these companies really have to commit to an energy transition. And this will, how they do that will matter in terms of image and engagement and how, you know, the public views them. And so this will really affect long-term performance. So it would be important to me to know what the company, uh, how the company is thinking long-term in terms of system, in terms of sustainability and adapting these new technologies and changes in, in the energy industry and, um, and what that would mean uh, in terms of jobs and, and job security. And, and so in, in summary, it's, I, I think it's a, it's an exciting field, um, especially, you know, for someone to know that, you know, you're, you're part of providing, um, energy to the world. And, and I, I think there's a lot of data. There's a lot of exciting things in terms of technology and, um, and, and developing algorithms and doing research. And so, um, I think it would be a, a really good field um, to explore and, and be part of. And so with that, I think I will turn over to Keith. Well, thanks everybody for introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your role and what you see as being important for workforce development. Um, let me just ask a, kind of an open, broad question. What have you learned on the job that has helped you be successful? And, and that can be as broad as technical or people or handling the politics. What, what's been valuable for you? So maybe uh, I can... I, no. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Okay, um, yeah, all right, let me ask. I think for me, the most important thing that I've learned is that technology may be important, but it's definitely not the most important thing. So coming out of graduate school, I was always 
fascinated by new technologies, by the cool things. But then, yeah, my mentor, he, he Chap, Chap Wang was my mentor, and he kept telling me, yeah, business, business kiss was the most important thing. So, yeah, that's what I have learned. And it it's very useful for me. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think so, I agree. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I agree with that very much. I think one thing I have learned, especially in my first assignment at the software development team, is that there are lots of really good new technology, but how do we deploy this really to the people's hand that sometimes is more important. Lots of time that we are struggling with that we have really good algorithm, we got really good workflow, which seem to work really well, but we have all kinds of different challenges when we're trying to bring this to everybody. I think sometimes uh, that's really, really uh, challenging to to really get that fixed. Can I add uh, another sort of twist to that question? Um, what about professional skills, communication skills? Are you getting that? Are you ready? Is it important? You know, and sometimes referred to collectively as sort of high performance skills, if you will, and not this high performance computing, but sort of skill sets in terms of your, you know, What's your experience with that and how you, valuable would that be for talent, to, you know, for new hires to have? Max, I'm going to call on you. You're quiet. Uh, well, I would say I, I learned most of my speaking and communication skills. Uh, speaking skills were at Rice, um, right? Like as a, as a PhD student, I think you have to give a lot of talks. You have to, you don't necessarily have to work well with others. You can be pretty independent, but you do have to be able to communicate your ideas through written and, and spoken form. Um, in terms of writing good emails, that's probably the the uh, the, the biggest skill that I learned um, in industry. You know, not writing emails that were uh, five paragraph essays, but getting the point across without wasting people's time. So I think that's a that's a difficult skill to learn. I think, and, and then just you know, efficient meetings, things like that. That's not something that you, I think generally learn in school. Um, and so, and those are the, the, the really difficult skills, I think, to pick up on the fly in the industry. Melissa, I'm curious if, if you have those things, if you, from tax perspective and what you're providing in training, is that something you focus on in your training? So we do have, and I just, the little light bulb just went on over my head, uh, <laughs> uh, because we do have uh, the HPC Leadership Institute. So TAC has all these summer institutes that are um, a week long, and we do everything from machine learning to data visualization. Um, we've done, we focus on bio and life sciences. We've done uh, optimization for high performance computing. Um, but we have one called the HPC Leadership Institute that we have been uh, co-running with our friend Annie Jones, who was on the last panel uh, earlier today, um, with um, talking to people who are in high performance computing, um, and it's open to both industry and academia. So we, and, and we've had in the last couple of years that we've run it half and half, roughly. Um, people who are in HPC in, in a center or, or in an industry job, but who are interested in becoming a manager, who are interested in not just how do I program, but what do I need to know to move up the ladder? Uh, and so, and we do make everyone talk in class. Andy is very good at that, um, picking on people when they're not expecting it, including me. Um, but uh, we also make sure that they understand what's the ROI, what's the, how do I write a call for proposals, how do I evaluate the proposals, what are the technologies that are out there, how do I deal with the financing, how do I deal with my senior VPs, and how do you, you know, it, it, we've come, the new topic that's come up multiple times is, is cloud, how do I, you know, convince my VP that I want to have my on-prem system when he wants to push everything to cloud, you know, and there's, there's, that comes up all the time, um, but we do teach, you know, we try to make sure that the students get um, time to get up and present. And each one of our camps and summer programs and REUs, the students are the students are given a chance to get up and talk in front of their peers. Uh, and in some cases, with the summer camps, their parents, which is for some for a lot of people a little bit more nerve wracking even than just talking in front of your peers. Uh, so we do we do our best to make sure that everybody gets that kind of experience uh, and that kind of lesson. And for the I'll, I'll tell you something funny for the for one of the summer camps. I actually teach um, I te a dining etiquette um, program for one of the for the high school kids uh, because from some, for some of these kids from the underrepresented groups they have not been to you know a fancy you know Morton's or a steak 
restaurant or somewhere where there's more than one fork in front of the plate or where, you know, there's China and three glasses and all of those things. And I've actually gone and taught dining etiquette and, you know, which things are which and how do you do which and, and pass the salt and pepper together and all of those fun things that I'm sure that we could do a program <laughs> at this conference next year and a bunch of people might learn from that. So um, it's a, it's, we try to give them as much of a rounded experience as possible. So Lane, you mentioned Chap Wong, who's been a very good friend of ours for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talked about the skills that he had as being a mentor. For everyone, what's your, what's your experience trying to find mentors, trying to find people that help you get introduced and what do you think you would recommend to employers to make sure that we are thinking about that? We're bringing people along. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a tricky question. Uh, I was going to say, uh, well, no, let me say this. Uh, so at for, uh, the first Chevron actually is very good at uh, mentoring people. So everyone, especially senior technical people are uh, are encouraged by their supervisors and by the management to mentor uh, junior folks. And so for people who like to mentor, yeah, they uh, they have a lot of opportunities. And, and also for young professionals who who are able to to come out of their comfort zone and to reach out, they can always find they, they find numerous resources. And, but the, on the other hand, yeah, that's why I hesitated. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, a formal mentor program is definitely needed for some people because some people are uh, not shy, but maybe introverted and are, are not are reluctant to, to, to ask for others' help. So they definitely need a formal structure and maybe assign the mentor instead of asking themselves to to find one so in in chevron we do in the horizons program horizons program is for new hires from first year to the fifth year and they are often uh, assigned they, every each one each horizon participant is assigned a mentor but after that it's a uh, uh, it, yeah it's up to themselves to to go out and search for mentors and but then yeah but i feel that for everyone not uh, no matter whether you're a new hire or your mid career yeah everyone needs a mentor in their career uh, at all times so yeah i guess then yeah to answer your question i would say uh, creating a culture uh, that encourages mentoring that's definitely important and a formal mentoring program is is also necessary for anyone else, especially during internships. What what have you seen from people that were your mentors that helped you be successful? I think maybe I can share. So um, I think when I was a new hire at Hotel, I do have a mentor and I think he um, helped me a lot during um, the, um, the first one or two years. I think many ways. So um, he basically was in the same team as I am. So he not only can provide me some technical um, suggestions, and also I think most importantly is because he was in Total more than 10 years. Um, so he knows the organization and Total is a big company. So with him, his help, I'm easier to understand the um, organization as the whole company. And also based on his career path, he can provide suggestions and guidance like for me to how um, for me to develop my own career so i think this kind of mentoring um program do help me a lot for my um in my uh, new hire um time yes emma j max anything you want to add yeah maybe one point um so i think one thing um i really like a lot it uh, at show so like we have different kinds of mentors. So so one one mentor we are um, encouraged to find is somebody who is not in your field, who maybe not in the same long business. So sometimes uh, um, that can help you provide a very different perspective. So I, sometimes I feel that's really valuable. 
because I mean, um, sometimes when I talk with uh, people who is in the same field as me, and uh, sometimes we have really, really similar perspective, and you may miss some really important points. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree, and I would, I would add to that um, because I think there's different areas where. Uh, you know, a newcomer can benefit from mentorship. There's the technical part that's in the same field as, um, you know, as the person, but there's also the business part. Like, for example, as Melissa was talking about, you know, how do you uh, present well, you know, uh, for the company and in, in general, or how, you know, some, some business skills, you know, uh, so one, could have different mentors for different purposes. I think that would be a great thing to uh, to help develop um, a career. The only thing I, would, I think I would add is that I think the best mentors I've had over my career have not been assigned to me. Um, and this is why sometimes I'm a, I'm a little skeptical of like mentorship programs because there it adds structure to a relationship that I think is inherently best off unstructured. Right, like a mentor is kind of like a really good manager who has absolutely no say over your advancement, promotion, bonus, or anything, because you can feel like you can be open with them and complain about things with them and receive their advice, whether it's technical or business or 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 just life advice. Um, so I think that I, my best mentors have been people that have just naturally fit into that slot in my life. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think the downside of that is it does mean that it's up to the mentee to, to seek them out and find that opportunity. Um, but I think that, you know, assigning mentors to mentees, you're just more likely to come up with a, a mismatch than a good fit in a lot of cases. So I think that's, that's the real challenge. Um, even though it's a, it's a really powerful relationship. And if I could add something that came up at the Texas women in HPC round table last year, round table is next Friday, by the way, next Friday from nine to 12. Um, something that came up last year is that there's a difference between finding a mentor and finding a sponsor in your organization. Finding a mentor is someone who um, you can talk to about your personal journey and decisions that you're making one way or the other. A sponsor in your company is someone who will remember to put your name up for a promotion and will say nice things about you to other people in the company and help you along in your journey in the business. Um, not necessarily the same person as someone who will help you along in your journey as a human being. So it's an interesting dichotomy, but sometimes you need one or the other, uh, and sometimes you need both. Just add another twist to that, you know, that's me. Role models, what do they play for different sort of people in the company? Because you're always looking for somebody that maybe, it, I mean, I, I will gravitate to people like myself. So how important is that in, you know, and in particular in sort of creating diverse workforces? Was that, did that come up last year, Melissa? Uh, that uh, did come up last year also as well. <laughs> yes, people are, you know, and, and it, this is part of the challenge of, of women and minorities in HPC and oil and gas. You know, women in HPC are a very small percentage. Women in oil and gas are a very small percentage. Um, it's hard to imagine yourself in a role if you don't see anyone who looks like you doing that role. Uh, and that's true of women. That's true for, for minorities. That's true in Hollywood, that's true in oil and gas, it's true in all kinds of industries. Uh, and so part of the reason we are pushing so hard on um, getting more women and minorities in leadership positions is that that will also sort of hopefully open the floodgates of more people wanting to get there uh, and seeing that it's possible. So given the challenges of the energy transition, the pull from other industries like cloud, like technology. What is the energy energy industry going to need to accomplish to help retain your your investment of your life in our business? What's important to you? What do you think about? Um, how do you judge the work that you're doing and the contributions you're making to make sure that you feel like you're successful. I, I guess I kind of touched on this a little bit. My, my five minute blurb was, 
you know, part of this is a, a societal like challenge is, is just, it's, it's hard to, to win right now in, in the recruiting space as, as a, as an oil and gas company. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think that's going to change in the next year or two as, as kind of the energy transition really gets kicked off. Um, I think that, I think emphasizing that fact uh, will make a big difference with, with getting talent, you know, emphasizing the fact that, you know, you can be part of reshaping the energy landscape of the entire world. Um, I can't remember who said it, but like somebody was saying like, like that's their pitch. Don't go to eBay and work on optimizing ads or whatever, you know, help reshape the energy landscape. Like I think that mission, like mission focused statement um, goes a long way towards making people in the company feel valued um, and important as well as like, recruiting new talent and, and retaining that talent. Um, I, I think that there are not enough mission focused companies in the world. Um, cause I, I quite, I don't count advertising technologies as a mission. That's a product that's not exciting. Um, but that the energy industry, I think the energy and defense industries are two that are unique in their, the criticality of their mission. Um, and I think that, you know, just playing that up is really important for, for keeping people engaged internally and then getting people um, from outside. And Go ahead. Yeah, um, for, for me, I think uh, the most important thing, uh, not, maybe not the most important thing, I think what Max said uh, is quite important too. And so another thing to consider is to, to make sure that uh, people get to see, I think Max mentioned that too, people get to see what, uh, exciting things that we are doing here in the oil and gas industry so when when they think about chevron probably they they think about the uh the gas stations or something and then but they don't know actually in the back end there are a lot of computing and and new technology technologies going on and for example actually i had an intern last summer and he was a he was able to work on a uh, cloud Using actually one of the uh, the newest tech services from Azure from Microsoft Cloud, and and used it uh, on the reservoir risk uh, reservoir simulation risk analysis software. So he was able to touch both the business and uh, the tech technology. So he was quite excited by that. And yeah, of course, when he did well, when we whichever offered him a return offer he accepted readily. So he came back to the same group and he's now working on the same thing and he's very excited. So I think that's actually a success, successful example for how you can uh, attract this uh, these new uh, talents into this industry. But of course the challenge is how to keep them because we have to find new and challenging, exciting projects for them all the time. And, but yeah, with the energy transition, with all these new things going on in the industry, probably that will become easier. I think you're right. I think if our industry is willing to make investments to teach people about the kinds of opportunities they're going to have, the technical challenges that we face, the kind of people and skills and the culture we can create in our companies, then we can make it an exciting, enjoyable place for them to work. So the really the burden is on us to make our cultures really fit. I think that's probably a good place for us to stop this afternoon. Um, let me encourage everyone to join in the networking sessions. And then Angela, would you like to close the afternoon?